Welcome everyone to Couch Potato Diary. Happy Thursday. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Yes, this is a bonus Thursday show. It's funny. I um, schedule this as a bonus Thursday show because, oh, we got boxing and we got uh, UFC coming up this, or uh, not UFC, AEW coming up this weekend. Um, and I, I haven't, admittedly, haven't seen AEW Dynamite yet. Uh, it's just been a crazy week here. And then we had some car trouble, so that wasn't great. Um, and the, the boxing, like we've kind of covered everything so far. So, um, but this is still a good kind of catch all here for like, okay, what's, what, what has kind of slipped through? What, what do we need to, to kind of catch up on here this week? And, uh, for one, the Calgary Flames played yesterday and I wasn't on Game Over Calgary. So going to, uh, the, the, you are now my outlet for what I thought for, uh, for, for that game. And then, um, uh, NBA preview stuff. We have a couple that we need to, to get to as we roll on toward the start of the regular season. So going to look at a couple of things for the NBA preview today. So should be a quicker one. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in today. Let's start with some Flames talk. All right, so the Calgary Flames pick up a 6-5 win in overtime over the Vancouver Canucks in their season opener. And there's a lot to cover from this game. But I think the main one is this is the exact type of effort you want to see from this Flames team. And I understand there's a seg uh, segment of the fan base that would like to see this kind of effort in a 6-5 loss. But I think that this is obviously incredibly positive from a Flames standpoint. And you don't want to read too much into it. I don't think when the Flames eventually are parading down 17th Avenue, well, hoisting the Stanley Cup at the end of a, a successful rebuild, we will not be looking back to October the 9th, 2024, as like, well, this is the day it really started. Like, I, I don't want to over... Um, over-exaggerate what this game means. It's it's one of 82 for a team that is likely not going to be competitive, and this game doesn't change any of that. But when you look at what the Flames are looking to accomplish this season, and what I am at least looking for this team to accomplish, very little of it comes in the way of results. What I am looking for are players developing and breaking through, and positive habits that are forming. That last part really steps up in this game because Calgary early on was outplayed by the Vancouver Canucks. But then once, <laughs> once they fell behind four to one, but once that second period started, they got rolling. And the really fun part of it is that it was not with what they, it, it was not a, well, we're going to outskill you or anything like that. Cause they're not, there are about three teams in the league that this team is going to outskill. It was effort, it was work, it was battling, it was all of those gritty, dumb things that people focus on in hockey, but are important foundational pieces when you're looking to establish a winning culture. And that's what this was. It was showing, and this was something that came up last year, it is the understanding that if this team is going to be successful, which again, probably not, but if this team is going to be successful or when they get to being um, a successful hockey team... It is going to be by outworking people. And that is what they did for about 45 minutes in this game. 41 and a half minutes in this game. Is they outworked the Vancouver Canucks. And they just, they, they won every puck battle. They won every race. They did all of those little things that you need to do to win hockey games. And they did it perfectly. And it is those sorts of things that you want to establish with the young kids like Zari and Pospisil and Hanzik and all of those guys is that this is the way you need to play to win hockey games. And so for the Flames to set that foundation this year is very, very important. And that is the type of thing that I love seeing from this group and the, the stuff that I want to see more. It's that battle. It is that compete on a nightly basis to be able to go out and get that job done. Offensively, I mean, they scored six, so that's sweet. Um, I, I do... I really liked Backlund's game early. I thought that he was kind of one of the only guys who was bringing it in that first period and then to be able to, to set up a couple of really good opportunities and help create some scoring chances that way with some good work down low. And his vision out there, like his his playmaking, I actually feel like it's getting better. And they mentioned a couple times on the broadcast last night that he is now played in more seasons as a flame than Jerome McGinley did, which is insanity. But he is... He, he, he is really, obviously, very good hockey player um, and has been for a while, but he's kind of grown into this other offensive role that 
has been really fun to see. And his vision out there was great. And I thought he did a good job of setting Calgary up and getting them kind of going when there wasn't a whole lot there. And I thought Pospisil did a great job in this game of kind of setting the tone as well for Calgary. That There was one that it leads to the power play goal for Uyghur that ties the game, but it was Mantha just slides it in and it's like one on four and Pospisil goes in, puts the pressure on Myers, forces him to swing it around to the far side where it kind of gets bobbled a little bit because there's more of a four checking presence going on there. It swings back to the Myers side. And again, now that Pospisil has done his job, it allows the rest of the team to come up and get in on this four check, which creates a turnover at the blue line, leads to a penalty, leads to a goal. He was doing stuff like that all game. And he also shows the great shot that he has putting that one top shelf. And so I... Uh, some of the old Huberto stuff comes back again, right? He had two very good looks to shoot the puck, and he didn't. He tried to pass every time. And so that's just going to be part of life with Jonathan Huberto. But I I thought that that line kind of worked all right together. Not a perfect game for Pospisil or anything like that, but I, I thought they were good. I, I thought the kuzmenko Kadri group was a little quiet in this game, and I, I don't think you really noticed any of them a whole lot. Um, Kuzmenko, I believe, had an assist at, at some point here, but it was it was a bit of a, a quiet one for them. And then defensively, you see some of the flaws in this team, that they had a real difficult time of defending the front of the net. And that, that, that kind of home plate high danger area, the Flames were not fantastic in that spot, and it led to a lot of great opportunities. And the penalty kill had some struggles. But then overall, Calgary, again, they do not give up. They battle back. And they, they scored some goals from distance, which is, which is nice, but you also score those goals right in tight that you are going to have to score all season long. And then Connor Zari, someone who we talked about as uh, needing to be an X factor for this Flames group, goes in, makes a couple really nice moves, and puts the puck in the back of the net. So overall, I thought a good showing from the Flames here. There's obviously concern now about Rooney. He goes into the boards hard. A lot of discussion about this hit. Um, I don't think it needs to be, it's not a suspendable hit or anything like that. The one thing you don't like about it is that Rooney doesn't have the puck when he gets drilled like that, so he is just not in a spot where he's expecting to get hammered. And I understand years gone by that guys would have been prepared for that, but this is not then. And so that, that was the one part of it that I, I thought was a little off. And then the fans chanting JT Miller was a little probably could have done without that. But overall, I, I would say you saw the positives you wanted to for the Calgary Flames coming out of that game, and you feel very good about it. Now moving forward into a game against the Philadelphia Flyers uh, coming up, that one will be on Saturday night. So that is the look at the Calgary Flames. We shift gears from one season that's just starting to one that's just about to start. As the NBA season preview ramps up, we got Two things on the, uh, the the docket today for that. We are going to look at the players who are going to decide the NBA season this year and players who are on the hot seat. Let's start with the players who are going to decide the season this year. So, the NBA season is very, very close, and that means that our season preview uh, is continuing. Today, we are going to look at the players who will decide the NBA this season. And th this is different from the players who, like, they're the best players in the league and all of that. These are the guys who, if they come out and really do what they do or do what they're supposed to do or whatever it is, then that is going to shift potential, like championships, conferences, whatever, that they are going to have an impact. And if it, if they don't do what they're supposed to do or something happens, then it shifts the dynamic in a complete other way. So uh, coming in at number five, I'm cheating, but it's two guys on one team. It is Jimmy Butler and Terry Rozier. The Miami Heat have not really done a whole lot since Heat culture reigned supreme a couple of years ago. And now you have Pat Riley talking about Jimmy Butler contracts, and it just feels like the end of an era could be coming soon for the Miami Heat. I, maybe that's a, a bit overstating things, but I think there is a lot of pressure on Jimmy Butler this year, and thus Terry Rozier as well. You, you had Rozier, Butler, and Adebayo, and they never really got going together, and injuries kind of kept that 
uh, kept that group apart for a bit. But I do think now, when you go into this season, if that is still the case, and there is ineffectiveness, injuries, and all of those things, then Miami probably just kind of fades off into that night. And then that leads to a couple of things. One, I think Jimmy Butler gets traded. Two, Rozier gets traded? Uh, I, I don't think he would get moved necessarily, but I do think that there, it would be a change in philosophy in Miami a little bit. I don't think that they, 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 they don't do the teardown thing. They just, they never have and probably won't. But what they... They, they might do a retool or something, but I do think it would lead to a pretty big shift for them and then lead to a good player being out on the market. And if those guys do click, they are a team that no one is talking about right now in the Eastern Conference. And so that would put some pressure on those top tier teams. So that's why I think those two guys are going to be really important in deciding how this year goes. At four, it's Chris Middleton. The Milwaukee Bucks are the forgotten team, I think, in the NBA. And the, yep, yeah, your time has, your, your time, you, you had your time, it has now come and gone, on to the next thing. And everyone's kind of forgetting that this is a, has the potential to be a very good basketball team. With Lillard, Giannis, sorry, and Middleton. And if Middleton can get back to what we have seen him do in the past, then this Milwaukee Bucks team, I think, still has a championship level ceiling. It might be one that they can just kind of only graze right now, but it, it is one where if they do have everyone healthy and playing the way that they can, they can still get to that level. But Middleton, I think, is the absolute key for that. And so if Middleton is going, again, Milwaukee can be a championship contender, and that puts more pressure on the Bostons and the Philadelphias and the New Yorks in the Eastern Conference. If Middleton isn't right, then I, I think that this becomes a much less dynamic offensive team, and they kind of just, again fade away, like we talked about with Milwaukee, uh, or sorry, with, with Miami, and they, they do kind of become the afterthought that everyone thought they were going to be. At three, Zion Williamson. We got so many, we, we've been getting little tastes of Zion in different play-ins and stuff like that, but we saw last year that he can go on a run and be that MVP caliber player that we all thought he could be, and we thought injuries maybe denied us of that, but there is still that guy in there. It is asking a lot, but if that guy's in there for 82 games, then this Pelicans team, again, I think could be a championship contender. This th There's a lot of ifs that go along with that, no question, but I, I think that if Zion Williamson is healthy and can for 82 games, just one, just one 82 game stretch is all we need from this guy. Honestly, probably 65 games, or maybe even 60. Can we just keep this guy healthy so that they can get into the playoffs? But again, this is a team that I don't think a whole lot of people in the West are, or a whole lot of people just in general, are really factoring into the West discussion. It is the Minnesotas and the Denvers, and uh, even Memphis, I think, is getting a little bit more buzz than this team is right now. And so... There's a weird Ingram thing going on there totally, and we'll talk about him a little bit later on in this episode, but for, for Zion, if he can get to that level, then again, a new contender comes into the ring in the championship discussion in the Western Conference. At two, Jamal Murray. It was a disaster of an Olympics for him, and it's not been great in Denver since they won the championship, and I get that was only a couple of years ago, um, but like they, I, I guess I, I said it hasn't been great in Denver since then, like they, they were... Very good team, and on the cusp of being the number one seed in the West last year. So I'm I'm overstating that a little bit. But for Murray, they have someone who I think really needs to get going. Because if he is not, they just don't have the horses anymore. And it, it kind of all came together in that championship run where he was going, and you had depth and a bench that can help push you, and then Jokic is obviously the best player in the world. But now, you have taken some significant hits to your depth, and you are now relying on a lot of pieces that are just unproven. You cannot have this guy not be at a all-star level. If he is at that level, then again, the Nuggets can win a title. If he is not, it is going to be really hard for this team to get back to that championship point. And so, for the other ones that we talked about in this list so far, it's a, yeah, you know what, you can squint and see that, man, they, they could really make a push for something. With Denver, we obviously have a proof of concept a couple of years ago, and they have the best player in the world. If he can just be, if Murray can just be himself, 
then this is a championship caliber team again. But if he is not, then I just don't think they can compete with the Oklahoma Cities and the, the, the all the teams we mentioned before, right? So he is... I think so important to deciding how this season goes for Denver and for the rest of the NBA. And at one, it is Isaiah Hartenstein. He comes to a Oklahoma City Thunder team that feels like they were a Isaiah Hartenstein away from being a championship team a year ago. And it it certainly seems like he just fits there in Oklahoma City. And if it is the perfect match that everyone thinks it is going to be, then yes, this is, I think, the clear favorites in the West and would give a real scare to the Celtics or the Knicks or the 76ers or whoever in the NBA championship, in the NBA finals. If he is not, if, if for whatever reason, it's just an oil water thing or whatever it is, if he's not, then I think the door in the West is wide open, given, again, what we talked about with Denver, what we talked about with the Pelicans, what we have talked about in the past about the Minnesota Timberwolves. And so I, I just think, obviously, that this is a superstar-driven league. We we all have that understanding. But the, the superstar play on the Thunder wasn't an issue last year. It was just getting those rebounds and getting those stops, at, at, at or some of those stops, I guess, at key moments and being able to rely on a big man to do some of those things. They need him now. If if he can be that guy, then this can be that team. If he can't, then it feels like it's going to be just another one. Um, j- j- just another, another good team in the West. So those are the players who I think will decide this upcoming season. Let's shift now to players who have a little bit of pressure on them for a different reason. It is players who are on the hot seat entering this year. Earlier this offseason, we did coaches on the hot seat. Today, it is players on the hot seat. And this one can mean different things at different times. Um, But for the most part, it is players who are are facing pressure for either trades or just potentially leaving their team or whatever it may be. So um, it's going to mean different things for different players as this list goes along. So coming in at number five, it is Kevin Durant. It already kind of sounded like he was on the block anyway. Um, Like, there was at least a couple of moments in the offseason where it was, well, they could package these picks together and go get this guy. They could package it and da 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 And for the Phoenix Suns, this year, there's a lot of pressure on them. We talked about them. They they made the list for teams facing the most pressure this upcoming season. When you are spending the amount that they are spending, and you have these three guys at the top of your roster, there are going to be high expectations. And quite frankly, last year, they came up extremely short of those. And so if this is another year where it is starting to kind of not go that way... I or not go their way, excuse me, I think that Phoenix could make a move and try to recoup some of the stuff that they gave up in a Kevin Durant deal. And there are a lot of teams who are looking pretty good, who have some draft picks to move, who might fancy themselves one Kevin Durant away from being a title contender. And so I, I think that if Durant and the Suns don't get off to a very good start this year, I think there could be Kevin Durant on the move. Um, For this next one, it's not so much that I think he would get traded, but this is more a perception thing. I think if this year doesn't go well for Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks, that I I don't know if Young gets moved out of uh, Atlanta, but I do think he gets moved down a tier or two in conversations. I I think we have kind of run out of patience in the Trey Young game. What we tried bringing in DeJounte Murray, it never worked. It never came close to working. And so we, we, there, there was that blip there where they made it to the conference finals and there was a lot going on against Philadelphia that led them to that point. But since then, it hasn't looked remotely close to what we saw from that team. And this year now, there isn't a, oh, well, there's just this this other guy who needs the ball, um, as my cat jumps in. You know, there the, the isn't this other guy who is chiming in and um, and taking a lot of the spotlight or whatever. I'm forcing that metaphor because there's a, a cat jumped on me for those who are listening. But um, I, I think that for, for, for Trey Young now, that this is, and it was before, but it is so clearly his team now that 
if it is another year of mediocrity out in Atlanta and for Trey Young, and it is another year where he is getting his stats, but the team is not playing winning basketball, then I think he kind of moves down a tier or two in a lot of the d discussions about NBA players. At three, we already talked about him, if you're listening to the full episode, in Players Who Will Decide the Season, but it's Jimmy Butler. Um, when uh, Pat Riley comes out and calls out your contract situation, in the off season, pretty good chance that the the seat that you're sitting on is a little bit toasty, and so I think that uh, pardon the Miami Heat pun there, but I do think that if Jimmy Butler wants to stay in Miami, then he and this team have to get off to a very good start. I think there was a lot of frustration with Jimmy Butler talking some smack when he was hurt last year, and just with how everything ended in Miami, and we know Pat Riley. A little bit cutthroat, a little bit ruthless when it comes to those sorts of decisions. So uh, I think the pressure is on Jimmy Butler to come up with a big time year. At two, Darius Garland. Um, it, it seems like for now, the situation has settled out in Cleveland. But we saw last year, Garland got hurt and this team did well. Um, and now you have Donovan Mitchell signing a, a contract extension. And we know in the NBA, that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to stay there the whole time. But it at least, I think, moves him down the list of people who might get moved. And it puts Gar uh, Garland right at the top. And so if this four-man unit of Allen Mobley, um, Garland, and, um, and sorry, Mitchell is going to work, it, it kind of has to work now. They, they have, I think, again, run out of runway for this to be a thing. And I think that this is going to be a year where um, th there's going to be pressure on him to go out and get the job done. And at number one, it's Brandon Ingram. This one's tricky because it feels like if they could have moved him, they would have by now. But it's it's a weird contract situation because no one disagrees that Brandon Ingram is a talented player. And probably, honestly, a from a talent standpoint, a max level player. But he also doesn't really seem like a guy who, if you give him the max, he's going to elevate people around him and you're going to be fine. Like, he feels like the max on a bad team, which is, it, it's weird. So I think there is pressure on him to go out and show that he can... mix his talents, sorry, it sounded like someone was inside, but they're yelling from outside, uh, that he can mix his talents and be very, very good and also be a part of a winning basketball team. So I think there's a lot of pressure on Brandon Ingram to to, to show all of that this year. All right, that's going to do it. Um, for, for the way we've been doing episodes lately, this is very abbreviated. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We're going to be back live on Friday doing the live stream right at 10 a.m. sharp uh, because I got a hard out and we'll talk all about that coming up tomorrow. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and I will talk to all of you later. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.